we'll get into the into the word. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echa. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu. Yehovah Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yehovah is our God. Yehovah is one. Amen. Father, just stay where, right where you're at. Father, we ask that you, you you just be with us today, Father. We we come before your presence in thanksgiving and and and, and just in honor and, and in awe and in, and in love and in, in, in just in reverence of who you are and what you. What you've done and, and what you will do, Father, because you are you are everything and, and and anything we could possibly need, Father. We thank you. I ask, Father, that you be with us today. This is your Shabbat. We thank you for Shabbat. We thank you for this day that you've made holy, that you've set apart, Father. And I ask, I I I, I want more of your presence, Father, and I want you to be with us. I want you to speak through your word. I want you to 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 Use me, Father, to to just bring your word, Father. Let let not my my thoughts, my just my opinions, none of that, Father. Come come out, Father. I ask if it's nothing is is of you. I ask that it just it stops, Father, at, at my lips. It never it never comes out. It, it never comes to fruition, Father. I ask that you you open the hearts and minds of you people that they they understand, Father, that they take in your word, that they want to. They want to do your word, Father, because I know that, that the people here, that 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 each and every one of us, Father, have a love for your word, and that we have a love to do your will, that we have a love to, to keep your commands, Father, and every single one of them, that we not stray to the left or to the right, but we hold fast to your word. And I ask that you bless each and every one of us, that you, that you just pour out a blessing upon us, Father. Open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. Pour out your anointing, Father. Give us... Give us your gifts, Father. Manifest your Holy Spirit within us. I ask and I, I command, Father, any any spirits, any any unclean thing, any 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 evil thoughts, any whatever may be, Father. I I command them that they leave at this moment. There is no room for anything but your Spirit in this place. And I ask, Father, that you 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 manifest healing. You manifest prophecy. You manifest. Just your gifts, Father, within our within our gift, within our, our presence, Father, so that we may know and that we can do your will. Father, that, that we know that you are true, we know that you are who you who you are, and we thank you for Messiah. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. So you may have your seats for a little while and I ask that you open your open your Bible. Because we would be gonna do a little bit of reading. Uh, we we are getting into you know, tithing, fact or fiction. You know, what is fact? What is fiction? What is what are the things that are not true? What are the things that are true? What are the the uh, the arguments out there, and are they true? Um, you know, last week we kind of you know we talked about Abel. We talked about. Uh, his offering, and we, we, I also noticed, you know, I, I noted that we, you have people that make arguments for the tithing, saying, oh, you need to give your tithe, and yet at the same time, they're preaching against the law. They have, and personally, according to the scriptures, from what I read, is you have no right to ask for a tithe, and at the same time, teach against the law that the law is done away with or it's nailed to the cross. You know, it's a bunch of hocus uh, But uh, And then at the, at the other side of the hand, you have, you have the, the Messianics, the uh, all kinds of other uh, groups out there. You know, I know there's other even religions out there that, that'll say, oh yes, we, we keep the, the law, but you don't have to tithe. You just give whatever you want to give. You, 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 you know, one of the, the biggest um, 
scriptures that they use is is you know if you're, it's it's freely given you freely give you know whatever is freely given to you you freely give and uh, if you look at the context of that it's a little it's a little different we may look at that today if not we'll, we'll I want to dive into that uh, for sure uh, if not next week the week after like I said I I didn't plan on on this being a marathon <laughs> Uh, there's just so much more than than if we just look at just the tithing, if we just look at just just the letter, but we also need to look at the spirit. We need to look at the context, and that's one thing that you will notice about me is I do I want to give you. If you go back and read your notes, if you take notes, if you you know you, you listen to something uh, that you can say, oh, okay, I understand. He's you know. I'll, looking at the whole chapter or looking at the at least you know two or three verses before and two or three verses after because I want you to get the context of things and sometimes that's what takes a little longer and uh, but I think that's important because I mean I've been going through uh, Christian church and they I have notes I, I laughed because I was trying to go through some of these some of the notes that I had I, I found one of my old Bibles and I was going through the notes that I had and it was just too funny because I, I couldn't fall I was like what you know? I had the title of the message, and I had the scriptures written down, and I could not figure out for the life of me what this this preacher was saying. You know, five years ago, or four years ago, or even last, you know, three years ago when I passed uh, when we left the church, and it was just too funny because I was like, wow, you know, I can't, I can't understand the, where in the world they were going with this. You know, the scriptures are completely taken out of context, or they used one or two words maybe from that. I don't know. I couldn't figure it out. Um, <laughs> And then even while I was in church, the same thing, you know, you, you go back right after service and you, you check your notes and, oh, I want to read this. And it's like, wait a minute, that scripture doesn't even fit what he was talking about. And so it was... I got a question for you. <laughs> in the Catholic Church, how do you take notes if it's in the Mass of the Latin? <laughs> <laughs> how do you take you, notes? You doodle. <laughs> you, that's... But, um... So, I, I, I want to give you more than just you know, just a single verse, just a, you know, even two verses. I want to give you context to show you what's going on. Um, but we we did, like when we talked about last week, we saw Abel offering his first fruits. It was a first fruits offering, and I mean, we see that Numbers chapter eighteen. Um, it was Numbers chapter eighteen when we see more of the the first fruits offering, and that's exactly what Abel offered. Uh, yet we don't see him getting any instructions prior to it. You know. Mom and dad didn't teach him to it. From what we see in the scriptures, it's not given to us. But we know he had to have had instruction. Uh, and also, he gets killed for for his offering. He's called righteous because for one offering, it's awesome. He has one. He has the best testifier for him, Yahweh himself. And that's that shows something awesome. I mean, I I could stay with Abel for a while because uh, so much of that. Uh, you know, just the fact that he's testified by Yehovah himself, by Father himself, he's his, he's the testifier for Abel. I mean, that tells you something like, who who testifies for you? You know, we, we see Job too, you know, Satan is going around all over the place and, and, and Yehovah tells him, hey, you see my servant, Job. You know, he's testifying that, hey, my servant is something, is, is somebody to be reckoned with and and uh, he sees somebody special, and to me, that's how I see this. You know, see with with Abel here. I think that's that's awesome. But um, let's move just a little bit for for a little bit forward, and let's talk about Noah just just for a little bit in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter eight. Oops, what's me? So we know we know Noah. We we have the the history of Noah just prior in chapter seven, uh, the very beginnings of chapter eight. We see we see that God remembers Noah, uh, you know, while he's on the ark. Because you know, I'm gonna kind of pass over because we know the story of Noah. You know, he preaches, he preaches and saying, hey, guess what? There's rain coming, and they're looking at him and you're an idiot. And they get in the ark, only eight people. They're on the ark for a year. You know, most people say, oh, there's, you know, Noah's on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights, and that's it. Now, yeah, we'll read your Bible. He was on there for a year. 
Um, he was in the boat for a year? He was in, in the ark for a whole entire year. Uh, so, if you <laughs> look at the scriptures. I want to draw a picture for you. Okay, the ark. It had three levels, okay? Mm -hmm. Top level was the people who lived. The middle level was for the animals. The bottom level was for all the food. Can you imagine <laughs> what that place smelled like after a year? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> that's terrible. But, um, so we see. Uh, Noah's on there for, for an entire year, and then the water starts to recede, and uh, it tells us in verse 16. So Noah's already there, he's at the last day, and everything is dry, or more or less dry, I should say, enough, dry enough to get out. <laughs> and then we see in verse, verse 16, or actually... Verse, uh, verse, verse 15, because it's, um, I don't know what happened there. Verse 15 says, God, and God spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wife with you. So tell him, go, get out of here. Bring forth, with, bring forth with you every living thing that is with you, all of all the flesh, both of the fowl, the cattle, cattle of the creeping things that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful. Wait a minute. And multiply upon the earth. Okay, let me let me stop you right there. Let me tell you what this is talking about. In the ark. In the ark. All the animals are commanded not to multiply upon the ark. No sex with the ark. And for the people too. Except <laughs> there, was, there was some problems there according to the according to the, uh, the commentaries. There was a problem. There was a problem. And the raven was one of the ones that disobeyed that. I, and and there's there's different stories. I mean that's where you even get this this new Story, this new movie that came out. No, I don't think it came out last year. Yeah, where it had a bunch of it had a bunch of nonsense in it, and um, stuff you can't find in the scriptures at all. So, um, but here you see, Father, as soon as you get out, that you may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful. So, I mean, doesn't that seem like the same thing? Breed abundantly and be fruitful and multiply. We always think, you know, multiplication is only children his only offspring but he told noah that be fruitful multiply read abundantly so yeah have children but be fruitful and multiply in other words everything you do not just see we're commanded this is what's awesome even in genesis chapter was in chapter two when father makes man and he says be fruitful and multiply that doesn't just mean have children that means everything you do should multiply your your money should multiply your uh you know your property your whatever you have it should multiply uh and, and we even see that in the talents in the in the parable that yeshua talks about would in the that, talents would that include material stuff too? yeah he was he says in everything you have multiply to and to me that's that's what what i see here and when you read it it doesn't make sense to just say, oh, just have children. You know, you know what this shows me? Noah was an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a good one. Uh, what's what's interesting is, you you know, when you read uh, in Matthew, which is the only place that you find the whole talents of, uh, of uh, or the, the talent parable, is it's only in Matthew, and Matthew, we know, was a tax collector. So you understood all this stuff. But I think it's interesting is that I, say you, it was just, I, I thought it was just talking about kids. Oh. See, and many of us have that had that conception that it's just talking about children. It's not talking about children. It, it can it can be a, about you know, multi, multiply your love, multiply your you know, like I said, most of it like in this in the parable, it's not talking about spiritual gifts. It's not talking about all kinds of other nonsense. It's talk, stuff like that. It's talking about money. So if you don't multiply your money, uh, I mean, and I know that's something that's definitely not popular, uh, especially, especially in the in the messianic circle. You start talking about money and, and prosperity. Uh, that that's a big like a big big no no. I from what I've noticed. Let me tell you what I've seen in Phoenix <laughs> in different places. In Phoenix, they don't ask for money. They have a box in the back. They don't pass the collection. <laughs> they have boxes in the back where you go put your money. In some places, they have a 
They have a box. You know, when, and whenever you, whenever I've seen it, one, one, one in feeding. They have a box in the front, and when you're, when they're ready, you know, everybody goes and puts their stuff in the box. So you can see who's not giving, right? <laughs> 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 so anyway, the rest of them, you have a box in the back, and they don't, they don't have to money your back money. The most organic food. Yeah, and, and like I said, that's because it's it's a, a a common conception. It's a common thing when people come into the Torah. From what I've seen, this is just from what I've seen. What I've, from what I've I've heard from other Messianic teachers and all kinds of things uh, is that it's it's like it's almost taboo to talk about money within the Messianic. You know, talk about tithing or offering or or you know giving. You know, you know. but uh, you know if we call Yeshua our 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 master, he's He's our Lord. He's you know, he's our Rabbi in a sense. That um, he even says, what distinguishes the the faithful servant to the foolish one is how they manage their money. So it's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll leave that for a little bit later. But um, like I said, I want to go into all kinds of things. But see, you see, fruitful and multiply on the earth. So he's commanded to do some things. It says, and all went forth, and his sons and his wife and his sons. Wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, that kinds, they went forth. So they started leaving. And this is interesting. This is, to me, where, I, where it gets really interesting. You know, he just tells them, get off the ark. Go, get out of here. And then Noah's like, hold on a minute. In verse 20, he says, wait. Noah built an altar unto Jehovah and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So this, is like, he's like, okay, I'm commanded to just go. So he, he didn't, his father didn't command him to say, to build me an altar and offer sacrifices. He didn't say any of that. Noah decided, hey, this is what I have at the moment. What I have is clean beasts, clean fowls, and I have all kinds of other animals. But I'm going to take... Remember. Seven pairs of the clean animals, the clean fowl. That's yeah. for this reason right here. Everything <laughs> well, else is only one pair. See, and we don't see that this is just for this, but it, it was, it was, it's amazing. Cause yeah, remember they were on the ark for a year. They could not have lived on just eating like once a once a week. Well, they may have. You know, they would have been all big old fasting, and they'd have been all scrawny. And, and but to me, it's just for uh, for somebody to be on the in a confined space for an entire year, you'd have to have enough food to last you for an entire year. So they were eating. They were killing the animals there. They knew. Even the animals were vegetarian. Well, after the flood, all the animals were vegetarian, including man. During this time, that's all they had on the ark. They did not eat meat on the ark. They did not eat meat before the flood. They did not eat meat. It's, it's, in, this, it's in this week's scripture, too. And, and see, and this is the interesting... That scripture we're talking about. <laughs> It, it it's there's some things that that uh, I just I to me I just find interesting, um, but you, well we know he had he had seed he had he had uh, he he grew grain we know that because he that he was commanded to take how, take of the seed of the ground as well. Um, how 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 did how did they eat this? Well, see, and this is the common conception. The common conception is that that uh, we only ate vegetables, you know, up until Noah. Until Adam, so when they got out no, no, no. I, they did not I eat meat. It's in scripture. It's in scripture. I looked it up. It's in scripture. Man and animals did not eat meat. They ate nothing but vegetables. But after the flood, man was given. Uh, we, uh, we after the and so are the animals. <laughs> 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 and this is why I say, uh, you know, we can, we can, we can say that, that, uh, that there's, you know, and this is a theological term, the whole, that there's progressive revelation. Um, that even like the whole Levitical priesthood. That, that it was progressive revelation. It was building up to a certain point so that there would be a priest. There would be a priest. We're actually, we're actually going to get into that a little bit. Uh, we'll get up, up to there. Um, but uh, he's, there's there's a, an idea that there's a, a progressive, because God always wanted a, a Levitical priesthood, 
and he wanted us to, to do certain things. So it was just a building up to. But Father says, I don't change. He's always the same. So his law is always the same. So his law is from the very beginning to the very end. And we know that. I mean, there's look at Revelation. All the way in Revelation, we see him saying, hey, don't, you know, the people that are going to be eating in, uh, or uh, we see it the, in the end of days anyways, in Ezekiel telling us that if somebody's eating of the swine and of the, of the, of the rat, of the mouse, that uh, they're going to be killed. You know, it's, it's a very, very bad thing. So we see at the very, very end, it's a, it's the same. and the very beginning, you know, it will be the same. Uh, but uh, like I say, I, uh, I'm not going to say that, yes, they were eating meat. No, they weren't eating okay, meat. Okay, let's stop right there. Genesis uh, 149. <laughs> Genesis 149. Yeah, he was given, he was given all uh, manner of, of green herbs, green herbs to eat. But we also don't see them. Uh, and 30. <laughs> Like, like I said, there's there's all these things that are that are going on um, where it can be both. Uh, there's because we we also we don't see we don't see Noah even being told, hey, this is what a clean beast, this is what a, an unclean beast is. The only thing in, a clean and an unclean are for are for food. That's it. So there would be no sense in saying telling Noah, hey. Bring me seven of the unclean, or the seven of the clean, and two of the unclean, if he wasn't. But, like I said, Let's stop right we don't there. know. You know, I disagree with you, right? I disagree with <laughs> you last week when you mentioned that. And if the scripture right there, the Greek one it says in Genesis 129, 130, and the other one I gave you, right. it says that even the animals ate nothing but the, the herbs. That's what this one it says. Even the, the animals? 129 and 130. Read it. See what it we'll, says. we'll go up there real quick. Let's see one. 29, then God said, Here, throughout the whole earth, I am giving you as food every seed-bearing plant and every tree with seed-bearing fruit, and to every wild animal, bird in the air, creature and calling on the earth, so uh, in which there is a living soul, I am giving you as food every green kind of plant. And that is how it was. So there's two ways of reading this. So like I said, there's there's two ways of reading this. I've I've actually heard from from rabbis. This is it was a it was kind of a trip that I heard this from a rabbi, um, way back when I first started learning about Leviticus and things. He said this. There's two ways of reading this. You can say that only the only food was given was the plants, but it says and to every wild animal, bird in the air and creature crawling on the earth. So it's it seeing like well, is that was Father saying? That you can eat the plants and the wild animals and the fruit. you know i mean like i said there was that that came from rabbinical and i thought that was kind of a trip but um every other source i've talked to you know they all believe that there was no meat before the flood and there was, and there was the only reason they had seven clean animals because the sacrifices no one knew about the Torah already the part that had been written he knew about that he studied let me tell you what how the history of the bible goes this is how the poets go adam was told everything that happened with adam Eyewitness account. He documented all plate tablets. Okay, he documented all plate tablets. Those plate tablets that uh, Adam documented for 930 years, they were on the ark with uh, with uh, with Noah. He studied all that stuff. And uh, and Moses was not the author of all the books. He, he was the editor. Is all he was. He edited all that stuff that didn't put together. It was an eyewitness account. That's how the Bible was put together. You know, Moses didn't write it all. He was, he, he was told what it was because it was plate tablets that were in the ark and they were handed down. And that's that's, he was the editor. And that's in the book I have. It's called, it's uh, it's, it, it's about the, uh, how everything was put together. There was a guy that was a nuclear physicist, and he had cancer, and one of his friends, uh, Christian friends, he leaves, so he decided he wanted to do a study of some of this stuff. But, uh, and then his page, Robert Page, I have the book at home, and it tells you how the Bible was put together, because all these people had already studied. They knew about the Torah. This is the start of the Torah. You know, but Moses was not the one who wrote it. He edited it. No. Yeah, he, he anyway, actually wrote it. Uh, according to the scripture, uh, Moses wrote it from the mouth of God. He was the he was the scribe of, of God. He was. Yeah, that's it's, what it says, but you know, that's the way the story goes. But, that's, uh, you know, it was already documented, and all the people like Noah knew about it. Abraham knew about oh, it. Oh yeah. How did they know about it? Yeah, because they. It had already been documented on on, on, on clay tablets. 
they do. Uh, like you know, there's all kinds of, of different things, but I don't want us to get stuck here because it's not that's not where I want to do. I want I, I want to disagree but, with this big thing. You know, this, yeah. this, I don't agree with you on that. But there was no, and it's going to be that way again. Because what does it say, you know, that the, the, the lamb and the lion will lie together because they all eat grass. That's what, you know, all the animals eat grass. None of them eat grass. Yeah. It wouldn't be that way again. It, it will be, and I, I do find that interesting. And, and like I said, I, I can see through the end that uh, there's there's stuff like that. And then he also says that, hey, there's still unclean animals at the very end. But like I said, I don't want to get stuck here, so let's go to verse 21. And, and Yehovah smelled the sweet savor. And Yehovah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And then 9.1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, so get this, this is, Right after his offering, Noah offers an offering. He gives from what he has. Yeah, and, and it's not just like he gave just a one, uh, you know, a one lamb or one little bird. It says he gave of all of the clean animals, all of the clean folks. So he gave of everything he had. It was literally everything he had. Because, uh, I mean, I could definitely assume, and it's probably a good assumption, and I don't really like assuming, but... It's a good assumption that Noah probably didn't have money. He didn't have uh, he didn't have armor and, and all kinds of other stuff that we find later in the scripture uh, to to offer <laughs> or to give. He had the animals and the seed, so he gave from the animals the best of what he had. He gave. So I, and then right after that, you see Father saying, "You know what? I don't want to destroy the earth anymore." And it says, and he blessed. So because of this offering, he blessed Noah. I think that's offering awesome. So he, Noah got a blessing for his offering. And then Noah, and then Yehovah said to him, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So it's the exact same thing that he said just a few verses earlier. And it says, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hands. Are they delivered? Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. Even as the green herbs, have I given you all things? But the but the ble- <laughs> so. But see that 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 doesn't mean that you can eat everything. Only the clean animals. See. That's a messed up right? <laughs> Oh, okay. Hold on. Well, see, this is the interesting thing is when when you look at this. Uh, I've actually heard this from our from a Christian pastor that goes in Genesis nine three, and says you say you can eat everything see at noah's time you could eat everything no, that's with you. No, oh with you. no 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 hold on hold on just hold on listen to my point here this is what i was heard from the christian church from the christian church what i was taught is see you you know you have you have your, you know jesus that that died so we can eat whatever we want you know, all you have to do is pray for it you know you pray for your food and that shrimp is all right to eat um and they say look it because you go all the way back to noah and it says every moving thing that lives shall be meat for so you can eat everything. But it wasn't until it wasn't until Moses when they they were stiff necked and hard hearted that that Moses had to write this law. And it's like uh, so that was the the assumption that you, with that. you oh I totally agree disagree with that. But that's what I was taught, and I thought I, I think that's funny is so it, it shows that Noah understood what was clean and what was unclean, and. Uh, well, let me, let me back up so, for a reason. Another yeah, reason that yeah. people live so long. They didn't eat meat. You know what meat did for us? It's not, it, it's not it's called circulatory problems, heart problems. And that's what the meat is trying to do. That's when their age was cut again. From 900 or 1,000 years down to 200, 100 and something. Because they started eating meat. Meat is really, really bad for you. <laughs> and and it's... God gave us everything. Why can't we call things common and uncommon? We can tell that in one of the so what I made is clean. So you quote Paul. You quote yes. Paul. He, he was talking about that. He was talking fish, about that. He was talking about that. Peter, yeah. Fish is a clean meat for everybody to eat. It has omega 3 powers. I mean, and steak would seem good for him. It's mm-hmm. good for you. But regardless, right there, it says that it's just a nut. He gave the fish in. Yeah. Why would you 
move fish into your hand if you're living dead a fish. And right there, every moving thing that lives, that is a thing, could eat. That's why I say before Noah, there was none. Like Adam and Eve, not probably, because there was vegetarian. But Noah, once all that, they got passed it out. I believe that the, the dietitian uh, of the soul needed something more sustainable <laughs> well see and this is what what i i love to do i love to um to look at the scriptures as away from tradition because i know what i've been taught and i've been taught well you can eat everything whatever you want and then uh traditionally in in messianics everybody looks at this in a, in a certain way so i like to challenge just a little bit i uh so you really you can think out of the box just a little bit and and we have to remember when was the Torah started Genesis one one it wasn't the Vedic or Exodus twenty it was Genesis one so uh, I just <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I that's why I say I like to challenge it's not clear it's not it's not specific that this is the only thing you can eat is is this and that. <laughs> There's, there's all kinds of. Uh, I've actually, I've actually heard uh, a few other things which I don't agree to at all. Any of, any of it, because it's not written. Uh, I actually, like I said, I've, I've heard that he's, he's had, uh, he actually had sexual relations with his dad. So there's. People understand. They don't see how the timeline goes. Yeah. Realize that Abraham and Shep and Noah, they all knew each other. Noah lived to be 900. 50 years old. Yeah, it was my number. So, you 50 know, he's he 350 years after the flood. <laughs> he knew Abraham very well. He, he trained oh, yeah. Abraham. Shem and trained Abraham. Shem knew Jacob. You know, people don't realize that. When you realize that, when you start reading your scriptures, you know, it makes a lot more sense because we think, we think like the Greeks do, we think this way. Very linear. We, we don't think about, about where was Noah at this time? He was still alive, guys. We were still talking to each other. He trained you. And people don't realize this. When you realize it, you start reading the Bible, it makes a lot more sense. If you don't understand the timeline, you wonder what Yep. So it's so this is uh, like I said. I don't I don't want to get stuck in this one area because you see. But I want to point out though is that you have you have Noah coming off the ark or commanded to just leave the ark. He just you know go on go. He he gives an offering of, of the best that he has, everything he has, of everything he has, and uh, and he gives he gives an offering. And, and Yehovah blesses him. He tells him, "Be fruitful, multiply on the earth." You know, and then verse verse eleven, and I will establish my covenant with you. So he makes a covenant. You don't get a covenant prior to an off the offering. There's no covenant made before the offering. And here you have, I establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut. cut excuse me. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood. Neither shall be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I made, make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations for forever. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, and that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember, I will put to the forefront of my 
of my memory of the forefront of what I'm, I'm thinking of or what I'm doing, I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and the flesh that is upon the earth. So it's it's really interesting how this covenant comes about. The, the beautiful rainbow that we see even to the very day which... Yesterday, I have to tell you, I, it brought tears to my eyes because it just, uh, I was thinking about this all day yesterday. You know, it was like, wow, you know, here Noah. Noah gets a blessing. He gets a covenant made all because he offered an offering. And I was driving and, and it was, you know, it was raining. And then all of a sudden, it stopped raining for a little bit. The sun had come out just, I mean, it was just beautiful. I was up, up there in, in the valley, in the mountain, delivering and, and, uh, it was like there was a rainbow, literally, it's like, you know, they say you can never find the end of a rainbow. It was literally right in front of me. It's, I saw where it started, and it just continued on until, uh, you know, I couldn't tell where it ended. But it brought tears to my eyes, and I just thought, wow, this is beautiful, because it's a covenant I can see to this very day. You know, it's... That must have been exciting. It, it was really neat. I, I was, uh, like I said, I just, I felt uh, overwhelmed to just, to just think this happened because of an offering. Do you know, you know what this offering was meant to be? According to the commentary, this offering was the same place, the altar, or the holy place in Mount Moriah. This is where these offerings were made. That's what they claim in the commentary. But let me tell you what, what the bad thing that happened to, to, to Noah, the reason I think it happened to it. It was a, it was a preview of what was going to happen to Aaron's sons when they came in drunk to the holy place. He got drunk. He got drunk in the holy place in Mount Moriah. <laughs> See, what happened, what happened to, to Aaron's two sons when they got drunk and came in drunk to the Holy Place? God killed them. God didn't kill them. He, he dealt with them, okay? <laughs> that happened to him because God let it happen. Skip over a couple more. Then we'll... So in between, you know, all this, and, you know, I just went through this, that after they got out, he got a blessing. Noah built an altar unto Yavah and took a very clean beast that we can found and offered burnt offerings on the altar. <coughs> Next one. And two more. One more. Yeah, we just read. So, get all excited and then I end up moving a little too fast. Go ahead. But, so after Yavah smelled his offering, he made a covenant that we still see today. No one is... And secondly, no one in his family got, a, got the blessing after, after the offering. And we see way back in the back of the book in, in, in Hebrews or in the Messianic community, is, as, uh, as some want to call that book for some reason. Uh, chapter 11 in the faith chapter, you know, in the very first, it starts talking about, about Abel and how God testifies to him. The second person that it talks about is Enoch. And then it says, By faith Noah, verse 7, being warned of God of things that not yet seen as yet, moved with fear. So he was, that's interesting, he was moved with fear. What do you mean? So, so God can put some fear in you? Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> and some people, that's how you're going to get them to move, is with fear. But that's not all for our doing, that's for his doing. Prepared an ark to the serving, saving of his house. By the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So it's kind of interesting that he becomes the heir of righteousness. We see Abel being called righteous by even, even by Yeshua. He was the first righteous that Yeshua mentions. First uh, John says that he is he was righteous because of his sacrifice, the better sacrifice. And, and then we see Noah as an heir of righteous, as a, a, uh, an inheritor of righteousness. Uh, and for offerings, that's kind of interesting. They said for offerings that they made. But, you know, like you say, those are just offerings. So what, right? You know, we're, you're talking about tithes. We're supposed to be talking about tithes. So what, an offering? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, 
we know that tithes and offerings are important. Right? You can't have tithes without offerings. But the, this, the, this is the tithes. I mean, this, this is offerings, though. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. But we know, <laughs> we know, <laughs> we know, we also know that tithing and offering are part of the law, both tithing and offering. Uh, the the Christian church focuses on just the tithing. They don't really say a whole lot towards offerings. They don't mention offerings too much. They focus tithing, 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 tithing. They drill it into you from the, the moment you you can think. Life bill, life bill, life bill. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it literally does. It's it, it it's just in some in some churches and some religions it's. it's it's like paying a bill. You have to do it. If you don't do it, you're cursed to God, and the devil's gonna come and destroy you. You know, because uh, they quote Malachi. <laughs> so you you see these uh, these Christians that are just pounding tithing, and they quoting Malachi, but it says, "How do you how how is it that you're robbing God?" If we just if we isolated that one verse. It says you rob me by tithes and offering. There's a conjunction. There's both. That's the context. If you're giving to a Constantine church, who are you giving to? You give it to Satan, okay? Are you tithing to Satan? Come on, give me a break. 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 And it's, it's, it is really interesting because, uh, you know, the tithing is, is like I said, it's, it's more commanded. It's you know we're supposed to give a tithe, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but the offerings are something extra. There's something that's over and above. It's something that you want to give. Let's call it stuff in different sizes. Let's call it sharing. You know, whatever you have, <laughs> you're supposed to share with somebody else. And if you're supposed to share, at least get to share what you got with somebody else. <laughs> more, right? But anyway, you're supposed to share. Everybody's supposed to share. That's what God is. You know what's really, really, I think what's really, really amazing, uh, because they're so important to the in you know in the Book of Malachi, they're so important to the point that you know he says you're robbing me. I mean, here there is the God of creation. He, he, owns, owns, he owns everything already. How can you say that? He owns everything. He owns everything. How can you rob me? <laughs> How can you say that? You can't say that. But the Scripture tells us that Malachi, because Malachi is a prophet. Malachi isn't just speaking his own words. It's, this isn't Paul. This isn't some thing. He is actually being a mouthpiece for Yovan, and Yehovah answers the people. And I want to get into this. Hopefully, I, I know we're not going to do it today now, but um, he answers the people because the people ask him, "Well, how are we robbing you?" And he answers. Yehovah answers them by saying, "This is how you rob me." So it's kind of interesting. It's like, how do you rob the Almighty, who in in Psalms, I believe it's Psalms 24, that says, "The earth is His, the fullness thereof, everything that's in it." From how do you accept an offering? You fire down and burn it, burn it on the altar. Okay, that's how you accept an offering. Uh, that happened to church. Whenever you get an offering, the fire comes out and destroys the church. <laughs> so, what, what's what's really interesting, and I, and I want to just share this with you, is that uh, Father doesn't have to accept your offering. And we see that just like Cain. I mean, we saw that in the very beginning, Genesis. Uh, he doesn't have to accept an offering. We see him accepting Abel's offering. Abel gets killed for it. We we see Noah. He gives this offering and he accepts it and makes a covenant and blesses him. But Father doesn't have to accept not our offering. To there's, <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's an there's a, a thing to it, and I and I, I want to just point this out just so you know we have this in the back of our minds. Uh, Acts chapter five. We all know the story. You know, Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But there was a man named, named Hananiah who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property and, with his wife's knowledge, withheld some of the proceeds for himself, although he did bring the rest to the emissaries or to the apostles. King James says that he, he brought, the, brought the rest to the, the apostles' feet. So this is interesting. This is Ananias' and Sapphira's own property, their own their own money and then Kifo Peter says, why has the adversary, why has the devil so filled your heart that you lie to the Ruach HaKodesh to, the, to the, the Holy Spirit and keep back some money you receive for the land so if we stop right there, this is where a lot of Christian people stop, they just wait, hold on 
and they they point out, see, look, they should have been giving everything they had. They, you know, they so they had to have sold their property. They should have given it all to the church, because the church, you know, they needed to help the church out and all this nonsense. That's what that's what's told. I mean, I've I've heard it. <laughs> I've heard preaching saying, and they stop right there. They don't go any farther than verse three, because it shows. If we just read those things, it looks like it's just. That they had to give everything, <laughs> and and uh, that yeah, very true. <clears throat> but it wasn't you know they say see because they lied, or because they uh, they lied to the Holy Spirit because they didn't give it all. Okay, well, why? How did they lie? You know, even if you stop right there, it's, it's called, it's called oh. a vow. See, when you make a vow, they <laughs> make a vow and they broke their own vow. But they did themselves. That's a vow you talked about. Exactly. So see, and you see verse, and then let's keep reading, because this is, I mean, you get your answer if you keep reading. Verse 4, but you sold it. So this is Peter, keep us saying, telling them, you sold it. The property was yours, and used after you sold it. So even after you sold it, the property was, the money, it, it was yours to use as you please. So what made you decide, so what made you decide to do such a thing? You have lied not to human beings, but to God. So they made a vow. They made an an agreement with, maybe they made an agreement with Peter. I don't know. It doesn't say. Maybe they made an agreement with some of the apostles and say, hey, you know, we're going to sell this land and we're going to give you all of it. You know, it doesn't tell us that. All we know is that Peter obviously hears from the Holy Spirit. Or, you know, has some kind of discernment to where he knows they're, hey, you're lying. You know what this proves to the church? Two things they have no clue about. What vows are and what covenants are. They have no clue about what <laughs> They broke a vow. Yeah, so they, they, had to die for it, okay? they, they promised a certain amount. But Peter's even telling him, hey, look, you didn't even have to give a penny of it if you didn't want to. This was their offering. They didn't have to. It's not. It wasn't commanded. Nowhere in the scripture is it commanded where you have to sell your property and give it to the, the priesthood, to the the apostles or to the pastors or to the churches or to to the synagogues or the shuls or whatever. There's no scripture at all. You know what they use this for? On, they use this, this tactic on widows. They go talk to widows before they will sell all the property, give everything to the church. Yeah. Uh, they, that's just what they use on right here. So the widows are free to keep anything for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they use on right there. Yeah. So and they have you know, Peter calls them out. He, he's, he's like, hey, wait a minute, you're, you're lying here. You you told us, or maybe you didn't tell us, you told the Father, you know what, at one point or another, we're going to give all this land, or all the money that we get from this, and when we sell this land, we're going to give it to to the apostles, or to, you know, to this, this congregation that's together, whatever it may be. But they didn't. They only gave a portion of it, and the wife knew about it, obviously says it and then we see verse 5 because after Peter calls him out verse 5 says on hearing these words Hannah and I fell down dead and everyone who heard about it was terrified so the young man got up wrapped his body in a shroud carried him out and buried him wow so he had a they had a funeral service and his wife didn't even know about it <laughs> How you like that some three hours later his wife came in unaware of, of what had happened uh, <laughs> they had they buried how do you like that they, they buried a i mean i don't know about you but if they buried my wife somebody were if my wife died and they buried her it would be kind of one of those hey where's my wife after after an hour maybe you know i could probably stand about an hour but after that it's like hey where's my wife you know apparently his his wife didn't even pay any attention to it <laughs> you know but he died because of not giving fully an offering that he made and it was it was a vow and it was what i find this interesting is it was because we know vows are very 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 important in the scripture it says it's better that you don't make a vow at all than to to make a vow and not keep it it's better that you don't even make one and so vows are very important it's one of the ten commands you know you should not take take the name of the lord your god in vain you know, that's it's not talking about saying 
gosh darn and all this stuff. That's cussing. That's not that's not cursing. That's cussing. There's a difference. But uh, it's making a vow, and he's saying, "Don't put my name in the vow that you intend to keep it." But um, you have you have this Ananias that comes in, says, "I'm gonna do this certain thing. I'm gonna give all this to a certain people, and because he didn't keep a vow, he died for it. But also because he was giving an offering. So there's two things on him. He was giving an offering, and he didn't keep a vow." So father did not accept his offer, because obviously he died for it. But it says verse eight, keep a challenge to her. So now the wife comes in, keep a challenge to her. Tell me, is it true that you sold the land for a such and such price? She says yes. That is what we paid. What we we were paid for it. But Kepha came back at her. Then why did you why did you people plot? To test the spirit of Yahweh, test the spirit of the Lord. Listen, the men who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. <laughs> and Sinesha collapsed at his feet and died. The young men entered, found her, found her there dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. <clears throat> As a result of this, great fear came over the whole Messianic community and indeed over everyone who heard about it. And this is from the Jewish Bible. I got a question for you. Did they go to hell? <laughs> <clears throat> We're not giving it all, but um, they the whole point was I I think this is offering awesome is that the father didn't accept their offering. It was it's an offering. It was something freely given. They could have given they could have given ten cents out of out of ten million dollars that they sold. I don't know if that's how much they bought it for, or they sold it for, but if they would have just given ten cents out of it, it cool. Yeah, it was an offering. What did they do with the offering? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they kept it. You know, because they weren't they weren't dumb enough not to. <laughs> they wrote a check back by putting the grave and stuck it in the grave with them. And you know what? We don't know. It actually didn't. It didn't say. It. But uh, <laughs> oh my goodness! But it it is amazing how we see that an offering can have such a big effect. It can have such big blessings for us, or it can have very very bad consequences for us and uh, all for an offering you know they didn't have to give anything they could have kept it all they stay they would if they would have sold their land they could have kept it all but they chose to give some and then after a while they chose not to give that much after they had said hey I'm gonna give this much so an offering killed them mainly an offering killed them and then well their vow just added the the Icing on the cake, in a sense, if, if you, oh no, they, they stuck the the cake in the oven after they did that. But uh, it's it's amazing how this offering is is so important, you know. And yet we, the Christian church has put so much emphasis on just the tithing, just the tithing, that they don't realize how big an offering. And this is New Testament stuff. This isn't like Old Testament. This isn't the, the God of the Old Testament that was mean and cruel and wanted to kill everybody. This is the New Testament. <laughs> These are the apostles that they were dealing with. They weren't they weren't dealing with the Romans. They were dealing with the apostles. And they died in front of the Apostle Peter, who they say is the founder of the Catholic Church. Because he was celibate and yet he had a mother in law. Anyway. <laughs> Let's go to James. James chapter two. I'm gonna take show you this. I would love to read the whole of this chapter. This is an awesome chapter. I love James. James is like the the uh, Proverbs of the New Testament in a sense. It says, You believe that there is one God. You do well. Good for you. The devils also believe and tremble. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See you... See you how faith wrought with his works and hit by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which says abraham believed god and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of god you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only one of the most powerful scriptures i think in, in scripture in the New Testament, definitely. 
uh, but it's verse 21, we have that, was not Abraham our father justified work by works? That's contrary to, uh, to the Christian uh, <laughs> dogma. Yeah, Christian thinking is just like you just have to believe and you're fine. <clears throat> you know, you know, just believe in Jesus and receive him in your heart and you're all good to go. But let me tell you, there's demons that believe. Are they going to go to heaven too? You know, hey. And then, but it says Abraham was justified. He was justified. He was made right by works. And, but it wasn't just because he believed. Because this isn't, this is what I find is interesting. The, the scripture that he quotes, that James quotes in verse 23, comes from Genesis 15. But James says that he was justified when he had offered Isaac up on the altar. So even Abraham, though we see Abel, righteous for an offering. Noah, blessed, heir of righteousness for an offering. And then here comes Abraham. He is righteous because of an offering. And this, I find it interesting because it says, and the scripture, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled. So it was made perfect. It was complete. So in other words, it was not complete until he made, uh, until he offered Isaac on the altar. Okay, I got a question for you. We're talking about another church, uh, <laughs> offers and tithing and all this stuff. These offerings appear to me, they're all to God. Is the church God? <laughs> exactly. <No? clears throat> so, Abraham was declared righteous after an offering. But, it started from his belief. There, there's nothing wrong with the whole believing first. You know, that's I mean, that's one of the, the first stepping stones that we need to get to. I mean, you don't get to where we are right now if you don't first believe. You know, you can't just. I mean, I know people that that have that know the scripture. They can quote scriptures and yet they don't believe a single word in it. I believe. Get your head off my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> James, James quotes from Genesis 15, Genesis 15, 6, a whopping six chapters prior, be, before Abraham offers Isaac. So six chapters later, chapter 21 is when he actually offers Isaac up on the altar. Chapter 15 is when Father says, okay, I make you, I'll make you righteous. You know, I made you righteous. It was it is imputed for him as righteousness. So I think this is awesome, and uh, yeah. I don't know if I want to keep going because there's a whole lot more that that I want to do, and I've we've already been going at this for an hour. <laughs> so that's good. Okay. <laughs> As soon as I hear somebody snore, then I know I'm going to do a quick. <laughs> so, it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, I could go I, you know, for hours on this because it's such an awesome subject. But um, you have Abraham who believed in Genesis 15. And six chapters later, offers up Isaac on the altar. And that's when James says, this is when he is called righteous. This is he was the, the scripture was completely fulfilled, and we already know the word fulfilled. I mean, you, you know, we see that in, uh, in Matthew five when he says, "I didn't." You know, Yeshua says, "I didn't come to to destroy the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill it." You know, so obviously we know what that word fulfill. It doesn't mean destroy. It's not saying that he came to destroy the law of prophets, and this is saying he didn't. He, you know, Abraham didn't destroy the scripture. That said this, it, he came to fill it up with meaning. It was completely full of meaning now when he offered his son up Isaac on the altar. But it started at Genesis 15, when he believed. So this is kind of interesting because you have James talking about Genesis 15. But before James, before there was, you know, there was Malachi, before there was, you know, before there was Yeshua, the man, physical man Yeshua, 
before there was you know the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah, before there was the king Saul who had to write down the Torah for himself because that's what he was commanded to do before Aaron the priest, before the Levites, before the son Levi, before Jacob, before Isaac, we see Abraham, you know, the father of us all, the way the scripture says it. You know, and most people call him the father of faith. You know, he Abraham. was Abraham. Yeah. You know, you have Abraham. You know, we're going to we're going to check out Abraham. And in Genesis 15, the next one where James references, we have the context, the first word mention of the word tithe. So prior to this, there's no tithe. The word tithe isn't there. But we see there's not even the tenth part of anything. <coughs> but we see how the scripture, the law is being fulfilled, is being carried through through way back in Genesis chapter chapter 4. You know, way back then, I mean, you, you can go Genesis chapter 1, there's all kinds of scriptures. The law is being fulfilled. Uh, it's, it's being, it's active, it's, it's there, it's, it's alive. And, but the first time we see the word tithe or tenth or ma'asav, ma'aser, <clears throat> the Strong's 46, 43, uh, very simple, if you want to look it up, it just, or, Plain meaning is tithe, tenth. I mean, that's that's the meaning of that word. Check it out. But I'm not going to dive into the, the the word because there's no need for. Uh, and I don't I don't do the whole um, uh, like pictures, the Hebrew pictures, and all this stuff because I <clears throat> I think that takes away from the simplicity of the scriptures and from the straightforwardness of the scriptures. But the first time we see the word tithe is with Abraham. And we know the story. We know we know of King uh, uh, or or we you know of Melchizedek. But what I find is interesting is this is all tied in in the context when James says he was made righteous just prior to to him being called righteous and Abraham believing. He gave a tithe. Now we can start, you know, in verse 21 when Abraham gives a tithe. But I want to give you a little context because I want you to see a picture. Because there's a beautiful, beautiful picture that you see. We actually check out. And, I mean, his, his Abraham's journey starts at, at chapter, chapter 12. But what's really interesting... Genesis chapter 12, that's when we first see Abraham, or, or Abram, Abram, Abram. He was first called Abram. Uh, I'm just going to mention him as Abraham. I'm not going to say uh, Abram because we know him now. He, his name was changed to Abraham. <clears throat> but in, in, verse, in chapter 15, he, was, he first believed. That was the first time we see in Scripture through his journey that Abraham believed. Yehovah. He followed Yehovah. He listened to his voice. You know, he father spoke to him. Abraham moved. He did. He built altars. He called upon the name of Yehovah. But it never says he believed until Genesis 15. First time he says he believed in Yehovah. And it was accounted for in his righteousness. So kind of interesting. First time we see it. But like I said, context of what just happened before he believed, before he he, he gave a tithe to this Melchizedek. We see Genesis chapter 14. And like I said, I hope you want to you wanna go a little bit because there's so much of this that I want to dive into. See, so you can see the whole picture of this because it is awesome. It really is awesome. Genesis 14, 1, it says, It came to pass <clears throat> in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Hit, I can. I, I've been saying this all like all week long, and I still can't say it right. Hedolom, Hed, Hedolom, Laomer. I'm going to kill it all day long. Yes. <laughs> and like I said, I've been I've been reading this all week long, actually in the past two weeks, and I still can't say the name like fluently. I don't know why. Hedolom, <laughs> Hedolom, Omer, King of Elam, 
and, and Tadal, king of nations, or king of Goyim. So, and I, I, if you notice, I have the little numbers because I want to show you how many kings there are. So, this is King 1, Amraphel. King 2 is Ariok. King 3 is, is King of Elam. King 4 is Tadal. <clears throat> so, we have four kings right there. That these made war. Okay, so these, these guys, these four kings, made war with the fifth king, Bara, king of Sodom, and with the sixth king, Bersha, king of Gomorrah. Seventh king is Shinab, king of Adma, and eighth, eighth king is Shem, Shemaber, king of Zebul, Zebulim, and the ninth king is Bela, which is Zoar. So you have nine kings altogether that are just right here. So, I mean, this is, we all. We all have this story that there's the four kings and the five kings that battle against each other. <clears throat> but I want you to check some more out. Because that's all the, that I tend to ever hear about this. <laughs> and uh, is there's four kings and five kings. But check this out. It says, and they, these were joined together in, in the valley of Sidon, which is, is the salt sea. So they were come together. Twelve years they served Hedeloam, Hed, Hedeloam Omer, and in the 13th year, they rebel. So you have these five kings that they, they war. Yes? Where is the salt sea? <clears throat> Where is the salt sea? Uh, the, you know, most, from what I understand, it's, it's the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea? Uh, but I'm not 100% 100, 100 sure you can. There's your. Uh, you can do a little homework. Find out where it's at. <clears throat> there you go. Um, but you have these four kings. That are coming against these five kings and they do battle the five kings obviously lose and so they make a covenant with each other and it says for 12 years the five kings and the four kings had a covenant agreement they were joined together and they all kind of were under this head of law head of this king of alum uh they they were all under there and then the 13th year so they, they obviously knew how these guys acted. They, they knew who these, these kings were. They knew this Amraphel, Ariok, Hedel, Omar, Tadal. They knew who they were. They knew how powerful. They knew all this stuff. Because obviously to be under them for 12 years tells you something. You know, that they were subject to them for 12 years. And then all of a sudden they get a little brave, I guess. And, and then the 13th year it says they rebel. So they broke covenant. They, <clears throat> they stopped taking orders. <laughs> It says, and in the 14th year, now, okay, check this out. Here comes Hedelaum uh, Omer and the kings that were with him. So talking about the other four kings. Here's the other four kings and the head king, the Hedelaum Omer. And it says, and they smote, here's 10th king, or the 10th people, even if you want to say that, the Rephaims, the strong ones in Ashtaroth. Okay, Number 10, number 11, and number 12, we're all giants. They were all the giants. Yeah, there's about five, five different names for them. Yeah, so the, the, the Hebrew word that Rephaim is that it can be translated as giants, mighty ones. Um, so this is, these are the, like, in a sense, people. So it may not be a king, but it, maybe it was a, 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 a town or a, a village, a city, whatever it may be. But it says, so there, here was the 10th. Tenth people, the Rephaims, the strong ones, <clears throat> the giants in Ashtaroth, Karnaim and Ashtaroth, that's the exact, uh, they say that that's probably because they had a, a huge temple to Ashtaroth. Uh, that's why it was called that. And you have the, the Zuzims, the eleventh people in Ham, and the, the Emims, the and twelfth in Shabe Kiriathaim. And the and you have the thirteenth people. The Horites in their mount Seir, Seir unto Alpharan, <clears throat> which is which is by the wilderness, and they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of there's fourteen people, the Amalekites, and also fifteen the Amorites that dwell at Haz, Hazez Hazez on Tomar. See that ten signs that. Um, so you have 15 
altogether 15 kings, peoples that are in this total battle. So, I mean, there's five kings, four kings that battled prior, 12 years prior, and they made a covenant, then they broke covenant. <clears throat> so they're a little separated, but they're still the five kings that are there. Yeah, these four kings that came, they came down and destroyed another six groups. So you have all this stuff, and then you have to remember the rules of war. Or not, I shouldn't say the rules of war, but the the uh, the perks of war, I guess, if you would call it. If when you win, you, the spoils. you get the spoils, exactly. <laughs> I like that one. Um, but, so you have these four kings that just picked up all this stuff that they, because they went and defeated all these people. So they have the spoils, the goods, the food, the whatever it may be that they have from six people. And they're six peoples or nations or kings or whoever they may be. They they had all this stuff that they have now in their position. So there's together there's ten if you were to think of it as like ten kingdoms, all their stuff is all together. And then they come in verse eight. So it says, And there went out the king of, of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Badma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. <clears throat> and they joined battle with them in the valley of Sidim. So now you have the other five kings in the first place that had rebelled against the fourth king, or that the four kings, the Heroloam and Amor. They they come to fight them. They come to fight these two. How big are those giants? I have no idea. They say that some can be from anywhere from nine feet, or you know, even a giant was you would almost consider a seven foot dude a giant then uh, anywhere from like seven feet all the way up to 36 feet because it talks about the uh, they were as tall as the trees in Lebanon and trees in Lebanon could reach up to about 30 or cedar trees in Lebanon <clears throat> and they could re reach up to about 36 feet tall so it's uh, huge um, but we're, uh, as much as I would love to get into some of that stuff because <laughs> there's all kinds of goodies in there uh, I'm going to kind of just glance over that one, uh, over that stuff, because like I said, there's all that we can really dive into. But uh, back to it before we get on these rabbit trails. You have you have the, the four kings who now have the six kings, all their goods, all their armor. Because, I mean, just like in war, <clears throat> you take the other people's weapons. You don't want them fighting back at you later or after, after you, you know, decide, oh, okay, we're done, we're going to walk away. You don't just leave their weapons, their 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 money, their their goods with you. Don't leave them with you. Take it with you. You know, I don't know. I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so they have all this stuff from these other places. So there's all these goods, all this armor, all this these armies. Because you know they had to be strong armies to defeat this many. Four kings defeating six. You know, six people, six, and you know, according to the way the wording of the scriptures is giant. So these are some big dudes. They're some strong men. They're they're trained for battle. They're trained men for battle. They're just like the U.S. Marines, you know, kind of idea. You know, they're the the, the Israeli uh, Mossad. You know, they're the best. They're good. <clears throat> and uh, and then you have Sodom and Gomorrah, these five kings, coming up with their armor, with their armies, coming up to battle these four kings. And then it says with uh, they, they come and they join battle with them in the valley of Sidim with Hedolaomer, the king of Elam, and with Tadal, king of nations, king of Goyim, and Amphra, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Eliasar, four kings with five. Okay, so for some reason people kind of glance over the fact that these four kings just went and they just defeated six. <clears throat> uh, they just kind of whooped on six other peoples. Uh, six other armies, if you don't even want to say. And then there's four kings come against. And then the valley of Sidim was full of slime pits or tar pits. <clears throat> and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. So these four kings, even still after whooping up on these other six people, come and they whoop up on Sodom and Gomorrah and these four, these other the four kings that are there. Get some packing. Take some running. They're off and they're hiding in the mountains. And they that remain, the ones that didn't die, they took off running into the mountains. They're all scared. They're all... They're all nervous. So four armies, or five armies, excuse me, just got whooped upon 
on four kings after the four kings had just whooped up on six. I mean, this is some pretty, these are some pretty powerful people. I mean, think of, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, uh, I've only been in a fight once. And it was just because me and my cousin were being, we were bored and we had nothing to do. So we decided to beat each other up. But after, after, <laughs> afterwards, I, I think, Father, I was never actually in, in, a, in any fight. But I've seen fights. Uh, and after a fight, you're not exactly like, oh, let's, come on, let's go do it again. No, you're tired. You, wanna, you know what? Let's, I'm going my way now already. You know, I'm going to take your stuff now. You know, hey, I won. The toy's mine. You know, it's mine, and I'm going to walk away because I'm tired now. These guys, they, they were so powerful that they just whooped up on people, took their stuff, and then whooped up on more. And, you know, this is this is interesting. I mean, to me, this has the idea of uh, that they were, they were very, very powerful. They were very, very trained. They understood how to use their weapons. They understood... Uh, you know, rules of an, or the, how, to, how to engage the enemy. Uh, I mean, kind of have this picture. These these guys are not, you know, just peon straight out of the out of high school or straight out of the school and, and picked up for the, for the military, you know, decided to get drafted in. No, these guys were trained. They had to have been trained. They were well, well, well uh, informed of how to use. But you know what this is? This is called population control. <laughs> and it's it is interesting how you know you see all that how they really they really took out a lot of stuff that they didn't you know later that Joshua never even had to mess with. <coughs> but so you have Sodom and Gomorrah fleeing out, and then it's verse eleven says, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went over. <laughs> Oh, Silence, the Lord is another word for the world. Well, it's they were. Uh, it's not another word for the world. Uh, we're in the world. Sodom is more a part of the world. <clears throat> but the things that they were doing, it was more. Uh, you see that they were they were more into homosexuality, lesbianism, bestiality, stuff like that. It was really, really corrupt. Very, very bad. We see that, you know. Anyways, we can go off into that one. But uh, it says they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the victuals and went their way. <clears throat> so, here's your little little recap of what just happened, just in this little little thing here. The few verses that we've read. It says, Four kings warred with five kings and made a covenant, served for 12 years. A year later, the five kings rebelled, and they break covenant. Four kings killed six kings, and, you know, and, and the peoples, the, the kings are peoples, <clears throat> and the same four kings now defeat the five kings that rebelled, that broke covenant. So basically, the, the four kings, or this head of law armor, was basically saying, look, you can't just break covenant with me. You don't do that kind of stuff. You don't break covenant. You don't rebel against the king. Kind of interesting. Sounds familiar, you know? Yehovah and Telling, telling his people, you know, you, you can't just you can't just break covenant. You can't just rebel and expect everything to be peachy. I'm going to come and put a whooping on you. <laughs> and that's what he did. He came and he put a whooping on them. He, he got them good to the point where he, he killed most of them and had the rest of them running up and hiding in the mountains and, and took all their stuff. So four kings had the spoils and goods of 11 kings and peoples, including a certain lot, a certain man called Lot. Abraham's nephew. This is a form of genocide. Yeah, pretty much. Doing away with a lot of, a lot of the tribes. <laughs> so you have these four kings now. They took they took a certain man who is is a nephew to a very very good friend of the Almighty. <laughs> And I have to tell you, there's, there is something, there, ha, there, there has to be something to being related, to being uh, close to somebody who is close to the Almighty. You know, you, there's, there's a little bit of favor there. You, know, you, you get to glean from the, the favor of, of this other person. 
And we see that verse 12. It says, And they took Lot, Abraham's, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped, and told Abraham the Hebrew, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite. Okay, so he has, there's Mamre. This is, here's one person, Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, there's another person, and brother of Anna. And these were confederate with Abraham. So these, these three men, maybe, they're, they had, maybe they had the little army or something, maybe they had a few people, but these three men for sure were confederate with Abraham. <clears throat> So you have three guys, Abram saying, and this guy saying, hey, you know what? They just took your nephew. You, know, you, you need to come. The, the, I mean, these four kings came. They put a whooping on Sodom and Gomorrah and these other two kings. And, and, and they just, they, they had us running. And, and he, you know, Abram's like, oh, hold on a minute. We see verse 14. Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive. He armed his trained servants. Notice servants is italics. Because in, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say servants. It doesn't say men in some versions. But it says, And he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued unto Dan. So it's kind of interesting. We can we see that Abraham gets trained servants, or trained men, some versions say. that Either which way, there were trained people that were born in his own house. So somebody that is born in your house, and remember, Abraham doesn't have any have any children at this point. He's you know, him and, and and Sarai are are barren. Sarai can't have children at this point. But there were people that were born in his home, because we know just Genesis chapter twelve, uh, I think even or thirteen, uh, yeah, Britain, chapter thirteen too as well. But they, he was a rich man. Abraham was already a rich dude. He had stuff. He had servants. He had people <clears throat> with him. He had, he had livestock. He had money. He had gold and silver. Uh, he had all kinds. He was already a very rich person. Okay, so he didn't need anything. But he is like, hey, I love my brother. I love my nephew, which he calls my brother. I mean, that's this kind of shows how, how Abraham looked at him, at his nephew. Calls him his brother. You know, there's a song about Abraham. <laughs> there's a few songs about Abraham. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but he was, he what he did, I think, was really awesome. Is it says he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318. So he armed his trained servants. And there was only 318 of them. There wasn't millions of them. So the whole story of 300, the, oh yeah, you know, where do you think they got it from? But you have 318 men, three friends, and Abraham. Go to the next one, you. Yeah. 318 trained men, three friends, and Abraham. Versus four kings with armies trained for war that just defeated five kings and their armies, sending them hiding in the mountains after killing six kings. I don't know. You think they had to? <laughs> you can lose all their stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> and and what's really really interesting is is when you look at at uh, at Genesis when when or at, at this scripture that says that there were he armed his trained servants. There's two ways of reading this scripture. That they were trained for war, which I highly, highly doubt, because they were shepherds, and uh, so I don't, to me, I don't believe that they were trained trained for war at all. But you can read it that they were trained for war. He he gave them armor, he gave them swords, maybe not armor, but he gave them swords or you know something to fight with, and said, okay, let's get ready to go. Or we can look at it the second one, which I personally believe in, because of another scripture in Genesis chapter 18. That they were trained in the law. They were trained in the ways of the Allah. Because Genesis 18 19 says, <clears throat> For I, if we look at the context, it says, For I, Yahweh is talking, know him, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. So his whole household, not just his children, but his whole household. And then they shall keep the way of Yahweh and do justice and judgment. 
So we know that Abraham disciple. He was a very good disciple. He instructed his people. And I mean, look at the other one of the other scriptures that we that we see in, in Genesis that he's it says that that Abraham kept my laws, kept my judgments, kept my statutes, my commandments, my Torah. So we know that Abraham knew the law and he taught the law. Father knew that he was going to teach his whole household. So this scripture, when it says that they were trained, uh, he he armed his trained soldiers or the trained men that were born in his house. What was his house learning? If it wasn't the law, if it wasn't the, the the commandments of the Almighty, they were they were learning these things already. So he armed these. Guys that are trained in the Word of God. I don't know. I don't so when you call fire from heaven, you know, like, <laughs> you know, when you can do that, that's some pretty serious stuff. Right. So we we see some some interesting. Like I said, there's two ways you want to read it. That oh, he just trained up his his. There was 318 that were just you know they were gung ho. They were they were the Marines and of of Abraham's Abraham's uh, little group that he had, you know. That's that's where, all fine and dandy. Where did Sarah come in? She's she's been in since uh, chapter twelve, but she's not here right now because Abraham's not. They're not doing with Sarah at the moment. She does not. She's not the one that needs to go out to war. Remember, they didn't send the women and the children out to war. They send <clears throat> even in the Torah it tells us that at age twenty, that's when a man can go into the army or into uh, service of the army. You know so. They didn't deal with the the women and children were supposed to take care of well the children obviously I, mean, I wouldn't send my twelve year old out to war and get killed real quick you know you don't do that kind of stuff you don't send your women out because the women are good at feeding and they're good at taking care of their children so that's why the women and children want to go but the men would go to and uh, so Sar Sarai Sarai wouldn't wouldn't have gone out at that point she wouldn't have had anything to do with this. She would have, but we don't see anything that she was talking to Abraham or anything like that. But So Genesis 14, verse 15. It says, And he divided himself against them by night. So he's going, Abraham, Abraham is going, we know that Yomavah is talking to him. We know he talks to Abraham. So this possibly, his father's already told him, hey, this is how you're going to do it. We don't see that, but there's many things we don't see in Scripture. But we see the result of what happens. So we know that something like this must have happened. That Father gave him instructions on how to defeat the enemy. This is a night. Yeah. This is back in the night. I guess when they're all sleeping, right? They're all, they're all crashed out. So, I mean, it's the same idea that, that he even gave Gideon. Everybody told Gideon, get your lamps and get the shofars and blow them and they'll kill each other. You didn't have to do anything. But only... I think it was only like 400 or 500 as well, something like that. Um, but anyways, it says, He divided himself against them by night, he and his servants, and smote them and killed them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of, of Damascus. So this is what I find is really, really cool. Because you had four kings that, I mean, they had the strength to go out to battle twice. I mean, I'm pretty sure that they probably would have just picked up again and just, come on, let's go again, you know, the way their stamina was, apparently. And yet here's here's Abram with his 318, 321 guys, you know, maybe a little more. But uh, from what the scripture tells us, there's 318 men and three friends of his. And then Abram that goes out and they're killing these four kings and they're making them take off. Like, you know, <laughs> like if they're being chased by, by 15 armies. And he brought back all the goods. Take this to verse 14 and 16. And he brought back all the goods. And also brought back his brother, Lot, and his goods. So he's got Lot's goods. And the women. And the people. And this is what I find really, really interesting. Because the only time in scripture that we see where... where if, Somebody comes and and, uh, and comes against you, and they come one way and they flee seven other ways. Is is in Deuteronomy 28 when it's talking about the blessings and the cursings. And this is one of the blessings for 
if you keep my commands, this is something that will, <clears throat> will happen. It will, will cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before you. They shall come out against you one way and shall flee before you seven ways. And this is this not. I mean, we even see that uh, a little bit later where it says uh, where ten will, will make a hundred flee and a hundred will make a thousand. You know, just you'll, you'll defeat a thousand with just a hundred. You know, and this is all because of keeping his command. So it's kind of interesting. So all the people that, that want to say that Genesis or the law only starts in in Exodus 20. Yeah, I don't know. There's a whole lot of proof that the law starts way before. And that's why we call the first five books of the Bible the law, not just Exodus. <laughs> but So you see him. And you see him doing something. He brings back all the goods in verse 16. All the goods. Lots of goods. And then, and like I said, have, you know, make sure you keep this in mind that he's just defeated four kings that had the spoils of six kings. So there was ten, in a sense you could say ten kingdoms of stuff. You know, of, of money, of of. I mean, armor of, of uh, I mean, everything and anything you can think of, apparently. Uh, a lot of animals. You know, you could, a lot of animals, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know if there were sheep, cattle, goats, you know, if there was any of that, if there was any, or if they just went to battle, because I know uh, uh, reading a few history things that many people that would go into battle wouldn't take. Especially if they're going to the, the country where they were battling, uh, they wouldn't take any animals and things. They would just take like the food provisions that they would have, like breads and things, as they go, because they were expecting to to destroy the other one, the other army, and take all their stuff. So there's there may or may not have been animals, but I mean, people got to eat. I'm pretty sure, especially if you have four kings and their armies. They probably had animals. Yeah, so they had to carry this stuff out somewhere or another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you know there was donkeys, there may have been horses, or, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, all these things that he has, or that these four kings had, and then here comes Abram and gets all of that. Because he's like, hey, y'all, this is my stuff now because you guys lost. It's mine now. He has the right to, he ha actually has the right to all of it. He has the right to all of it. And, uh, and the, the men that went with him, they all have a portion that they can get from him. <clears throat> and then we see verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Hedelaomer, Hedola getting better, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shabbat, which is the king's dale. So he now Sodom, all of a sudden he comes out. He comes out from his hiding. King of Sodom comes out. And he's like, oh, oh. Yay, hey, here, here's Abraham. Yeah. We're buddies, we're buddies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I noticed you have all this stuff, Abraham. And, and, and uh, <laughs> he comes out from the mountain. He comes out from hiding from behind the rocks. And, and all of a sudden, here he's there. And then we get this strange person that just shows up. Verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Malachzadik, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. There's only three places in the entire Bible that mention this name. Uh, Psalm 110, or well, Genesis 14, obviously. Uh, Psalm 110 and Hebrews. Yeah. The book of Hebrews. The commentaries say this is Shem. <laughs> well, see, this is really interesting because all we, for, for one, we know that here Melchizedek says, or Melchizedek just shows up on the scene. This Malachzadik, this priest of the Most High God, okay, he's a priest of the Most High God. You know, he's not just the priest of Baal, he's not the priest of Ashtaroth, he's not the, the priest of, 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 you know, Nimrod. He's the priest of the Most High God. And he just shows up. And what's interesting, it says he's a king. So he's not just a priest, but he's a king. And he's a king of Salem. Salem is basically another word for 
peace or Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's what you know. Many people have have, and I'm not going to speculate anything because I don't know. There's all kinds of writings. There's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of whatevers that can t that will tell you this is what it means. But you know what? According to the scripture, it doesn't tell us exactly what it means. It's kind of it's real vague. <clears throat> but he's the king of, of peace. He's the king of Salem, this Melchizedek, this priest of the Most High, and he comes and he brings bread and he wine. He brings bread and wine, and he blesses Abram. But I mean, catch this picture for just a minute. You have Abram, Abram coming into a battle. He's in in hostile territory. He is he is he is. He just fought all. He doesn't know who his enemies are. There's four kings. Goodness sake, you can't. You just know the people who are with you. You know those are the ones you know who are with you. I, like I said, I've seen. I haven't been in the fights, but I've seen fights. And you, the person who's fighting, before they go up somewhere. I mean, I remember in school, or uh, you know, and uh, they would, they would be like, "Hey, you with me? You with me?" Before they go on, you know, they want to make sure who's with them because they don't want to get blindsided. They don't want to get all of a sudden they're they're you know, doing a number on somebody, and then somebody that they think is with them, or they they, they don't they didn't ask, all of a sudden comes up and blinds heads and pops them in the back of the head. You know, they don't. So they want to know who's with them. You want to know who's with you. So I'm sure Abraham knew his 318 men. For one, they were born in his house, so he knows every single one of them. He's probably seen every single one of them being born. Um, but he knew them. He knew who was with him. He knew his three friends. You know who your friends are. So he goes into a place and has no idea who these enemies are. He just knows, I'm getting my nephew lot, and I'm going to whoop on anybody who is, who's there. You know, that's from what I read the scriptures, that's what it looks like. And he's... You know, you know what else you see from this? You see the picture of the temple. In the temple, there was a representative of the priest, who was the priest of the Most High God. That's who the priest was. That's what this was. <laughs> See, and this is what's interesting is is you got to ask yourself why in the world would Abram Abraham even know would give this man anything or accept him or not just like as soon as he sees him wants to try to kill him. If, yeah, Thirty-nine years later, that's why. If uh, <laughs> if Abram if Abram didn't know who Melchizedek was, from what we see, we don't we don't know if he knew. It doesn't say the scripture never says that that Abram. You know, knew him that Abraham had spent time with him, or this was the first encounter with him. I mean, there's some people that say this was the first and only encounter with Melchizedek, but I, I, I don't know about you, but if it was me, I had all kinds of stuff, and I'm gonna give something away. I wouldn't give it to somebody I don't know. I got it. He spent 39 years with him. Okay, he spent living with him 39 years. He did the math. You know, 39 years. Oh, it's 10% of what I got right here. <laughs> so, you have, a, you, have a, you have this this strange character just show up out of nowhere, uh, and and he blesses Abram and says, Blessed be Abram, the, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And if you notice his words, uh, Abraham, Abram does something, the exact same thing, just a little bit later, and he makes it very clear, and he knows because he says that I... I lift my hands up to Yehovah, who is the the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. I mean, the exact same phrase, except except Abram uses the name Yehovah. So he obviously knew that this man was a priest of Yehovah. He was he was somebody important. He recognized this. He must have. If this was his very first encounter, if this was the only time Abram ever saw this man. Then obviously Abram understood that this man was important, that he was special. You know what? This probably the location. They didn't say anything about the location. The people of Salem, you know, it's Mount Moriah. What we're talking about. It doesn't say that here. Yes, it doesn't tell us exactly where he was at. The last place we know is <clears throat> is that the king of Sodom in verse 17 came and met them at the valley of Shaveh. So. Uh, that's as far as we know where the valley of Shabbat you know in that area where they did they move after that I don't know but um, 
It says, verse 20, it says, And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered their enemies into your hand. And Abram, he gave him tenths, tithes of all. Okay, that's, that's a very, very interesting statement. One word. First time we see the word tithe, first time we see the mention of, of the tenth being given, it is in the context of everything, the spoils, the, you know, whatever the kings of that moment had. All the spoils of Sodom and Gomorrah, even if we just like looked at that, because we know that for sure they took all of Sodom and Gomorrah's spoils. So there's two kingdoms worth of stuff. <clears throat> and I dare to say that yes they had money <laughs> you know they had gold they had silver garage sale of the century the suka sale of the century no. <laughs> but um he gave abram gave tithes of all so it wasn't just a single tithe of everything he gave tithes of, of, if there were horses, he gave tithes of, of camels, he gave tithes of the gold, of the silver, of the, the armor, the of, the, the of the people. He actually had people. So very possibly gave him tithes of the people. You know, and, you know everything that Abraham had before getting anything, because before this, we, don't, we just see him getting the stuff, bringing it back, and actually before saying, okay, this is mine, this is going to be, for you, you know, here's my, my three buddies. I'm going to give you your portions of this because this is, you deserve this. You went out to battle with me. And before he even passed anything out, before he did anything, he gave a tithe of everything. So that's kind of an interesting little little deal. And then verse 21, let's keep on going here. Today. Well, this is what the Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> claim, you know, that, you know that they, that that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do and the Mormons do. When they have a job, the first 10% is taken right off the top. Uh, oh, yeah. That. yeah, they're they're actually forced to you're 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 almost like when you bring in you get into the you become a member of their church, you you give them your bank accounts uh and they take off ten percent, yeah, right off the bat. So to me that's not even that's not a tithe, that's a that's you you're just being like the government and you're you're just taking the money away without even giving. Because notice Abraham wasn't told you have to give this amount to me because I'm the priest of the Most High. You know, he, he gave it. Without the rest. Yeah, he gave it, and I I asked the question. I just asked the question because it, and I and I, I don't know, and I've yet to find an answer that is scriptural. I can find all kinds of things. There's all kinds of stuff and nonsense out there, uh, but something that that really truly makes sense and that I can find scripturally. But who If he was a if he was a priest, he was obviously priesthood. But where was he priest at? This was way before temple. This is way before Moses went up to Mount Sinai and got the idea for the tabernacle. So where was this priest? He was also king, so remember that. Put that one in there. <clears throat> there you go. So, and where was he king? You know, I, I, it doesn't say it, it, king of Salem, but uh, it's interesting that you know we have these questions like what, 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 where was he priest? What were his priestly duties? You know, was was he a priest after the same thing that that Levi that Aaron was a priest? You know. I don't think so. Exactly. And this is interesting. So we see that Abraham messes with or has an encounter with a priest of the Most High, yet there's no temple, there's no tabernacle, there's no Levitical system. So what were his duties? And who was... And this is this is one of those things that I find very interesting, is that he he says, uh, or the scripture says that he's the priest 
of the Most High. Mm. He is a priest. I want to kind of say that a couple of times. No. I know he's not. He's not. Because he's a priest. Yeshua is the high priest. We have a high priest according to the book of Hebrews, which I want to dive into, but I'm uh, no, not today. But um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's Melchizedek. Uh, so <laughs> and well, it never says Enoch's name was changed. Never says it, you know. It tells us whose names were changed. Abraham. Abraham Abram was changed to Abraham. Uh, Jacob was changed to Israel. Israel. Sarah. Sarah. Yeah, so you have people, and they were, they told Joshua, us, they were changed to Isaiah. yeah, Mosea to Joshua, or Hosea to Yehoshua, you know, it tells us when people's names were changed. And so this priest, I find it interesting, is very big, it's a very big mystery. We see in Psalms 110, and which is a, a you know, it tells, it's a very messianic, we see that especially, you know, he's the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, you know, we know that's it's talking about Yeshua. I mean, that's plain and simple, and because we see later in the book of Hebrews that that it's the same thing that Yeshua did this order after Melchizedek. So, but we don't have the duties of Melchizedek. We don't see what's going on with Melchizedek. We just know he comes. We know he's in the blessing business, and we know that. But uh, I don't know. You know it's kind of interesting. Free. <laughs> you said the wrong question over somebody. <laughs> See, and that's and that's. I heard the same. I heard the same um, announcement twice. It says there are questions that can be answered when you go to heaven. It's very. I truly, I, I truly, truly, like, truly believe that we can. That Father, because of His Spirit, you know, just like if we look at Abraham, uh, just prior to. To all this going on in chapter 13, Abraham Abraham is there and, and Father says, you know what, am I going to leave something mysterious to Abraham? You know, because he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to burn him up. But he says, am I going to leave that as like a mystery? Am I going to kind of hide this from Abraham? But instead he goes, and because of the, the relationship that Abraham has with Yehovah, that he comes and tells Abraham what he's going to gonna do. And then Abraham tries to plead for him. And finally, he's like, I'll figure that you do what you want. You know? <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like, your will be done kind of idea. But I believe, truly I believe, because of this, because of, of if we have, or because if we have a relationship with the Father, and we're led by the Spirit, because we're not supposed to be led by man, we're not supposed to be led by by feelings, by emotions, by, you know, we're not even supposed to be led by the Torah. I will boldly say that. It, the scripture tells us we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. We're supposed to keep His commands, because that shows how we love Him. But we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. And I think if we have that relationship, we're being led. The Father will give us answers. And He'll show us through the scriptures. And for me, you know, i got to work on my relationship because I have no idea. You're not keeping Torah. How can you be led by the Spirit? <laughs> That's the truth. <clears throat> because if, if you're led by if you're led by a Spirit and you're not keeping the Torah, then you're not led by the Holy Spirit. Because Yehovah is holy. Be holy, for I am holy. So the Spirit that is in you, is, if it's holy, it's Yehovah's Spirit. So is that why I was telling you? I heard that before a long time ago, but because it's in the earth and in heaven. Yeah. Uh, yes and yes and no. Long? Yes and no. Yes and no. Because I don't, I, I, like I said, there's things in the scriptures that we have no, I will never ever figure out why or what. And Father may reveal it to us at one point or another. Uh, we, he may wait till we're sitting there in the New Jerusalem and he's he's talking to us from his, his throne. You know, I don't, I don't know. But what's, like I said, what I find is really, really interesting is that we don't know too much about this. Um, I don't want to get into Hebrews. I want to jump into Hebrews 7. Um, 
but I won't yet. Uh, according to the scripture, no, because Father chooses who is a who is a high priest, who is the priest. Father didn't. The the Levites did not choose for themselves. They chose to follow him and not worship the the calf at the moment. Uh, but Father said, "Okay, I choose you because you're gonna choose me." He chooses, you know, Yeshua himself chose apostles. He chose disciples. He didn't, people weren't doing something, uh, how do I say this? They didn't do something specific to say, hey, I'm an apostle. Yeshua, they didn't even know they were apostles until the very day, the very, very last day that Yeshua went up to that, that, that or when he ascended. Not up in heaven, but when he ascended. I think I gave you that paper on the kingdom of priests, but it's actually we're kingdom of rabbi. If you say the Ronnie blessing over somebody, it's in the, it's in the Talmud twice. <laughs> yeah. It says if you say the Ronnie blessing over somebody, you, you, you consider yourself to be a priest. Yeah. And it's in the Talmud. It would say that in the Talmud because it comes from a rabbinical standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you have to No, 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 I disagree with you because Yeshua was never a priest. He's not a priest. He was called a rabbi the whole time that he was on the planet. He was never called a priest. He was called a rabbi. So it's a different order. It's yeah, not... and that's why he said no one should be called rabbi because only he could. That's why when he came to preach against the priests and the rabbis, he was going against the additional word. Well, the problem yeah. that we have is there's two different orders. you got the order of the Levites. And he was not a Levite. He was the order of the Shizendek. And that's the order that, mm -hmm. that the kingdom of priests is, is going to be. And it's not the order of, of Levites. It's going to be, it's going to be the Shizendek. That's what the new order is. They're not going to be priests. They're going to be rabbis. Uh, well, uh, anyway, yeah. we, we I wrote are. that paper on that. Take a look at it. Go, go to the next one. Yeah. yeah, so go, keep on going. Went through that before passing one piece of clothing, he ties to Melchizedek. And next one. Yeah, so we see that Abraham is already rich. So he didn't need any of this stuff. Any of the material, any of the, the stuff that he acquired, the goods, the, the monies, the, the, the flocks, the herds, whatever it was that he had, he didn't need any of it. Because we can see it in, in Genesis 13, uh, 2 through 6. We, it's, it tells that he, he was very wealthy. He had gold, he had silver for all the people that think that he didn't have money. Uh, you know, obviously he didn't have dollar bills, but <laughs> he had gold and silver stuff that actually that uh, was used up until the good old Federal Reserve. So what he paid for, he gave him a trade, he paid a bunch of money, but it was in the millions of dollars at that time. Yeah, uh, so he, he has a, uh, Abraham is rich. He didn't need anything that he acquired. He could have just, just given it back. He could have just brought it back and said, here you go. I don't need it. It's all yours. You know, King of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons. Next one. Give me the persons and take the goods to yourself. So even the king of Sodom is saying, Look, just give me the people back. I want my I want my people back. Because you can't be a king if you don't have nobody under you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you can have them back. But <laughs> but even even the king of Sodom says, Look, take all the goods. It's like, thank you. You ridded us of an oppressor. You ridded us of, of having to, to deal with this person again, the, these kings that would have just come and just wiped us out completely. But Abram said, check this out, it says, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand, I have made an oath, is what he's saying, I have lifted up my hand unto Jehovah, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Remember I told you that he said the exact same words as, the, as Melchizedek did. It says that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet. So he's not going to take a, the smallest of thing from, from this, this what king. Does shoe mean? Literally your shoelaces. Oh, uh, shoelaces. Like your shoelaces, or oh. a little whatever. He's not taking something so small as that. <laughs> <laughs> it says, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest any should say, 
I have, lest you should say, excuse me, that you should say, talking to the king of Sodom, I have made Abram rich. So he's not even going to take a single thing. So I find this very, very interesting. According to Abraham, Abram made a covenant. He made an oath. We don't see it anywhere in scripture prior to this. But it says that he made an oath that he won't take a single thing from the king of Sodom. And I find that really interesting. Because for one, that tells us that, hey, not everything in Abraham's life is, is written down for us. <clears throat> and, you know, for all the people that say that, oh, everything, the, that everything that there's ever needs, that uh, there's everything about Abraham's life, about Jacob's life, about Yeshua's life is all written down. No, it's not. And there's proof right there that he says, I made an oath. I've lifted up my hands. Nowhere does it say that he did it prior to this. And then you have, yeah, just verse 24. Save only that which the young men of Eden. So remember, he took 318 men and that's his three, three buddies. It says, you know, I can't give you back what, what they ate already. So they, you know that they picked up food from what, when they went out to the, some of the spoil was food. Obviously it was, it was food because it says, hey, they ate some. I can't give that back to you. Sorry. But, and the portion of the men which went with me. Okay, and I just call them What's your portion? Yeah, it doesn't say exactly how much they oh, got. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Let them take their portion. <clears throat> so he's like, So these guys earned it. But he's like, he's saying the only, he the only wanted one thing. He wanted the men that went with, with him. To get their portion, he didn't want nothing. He, he, he didn't want a single thread. Okay, that question. What did the servants get? The 318. <laughs> Probably nothing, because they were they were born in his house, so they were they were rich. So and and according to the scripture, they didn't give. Yeah, you know that. And see, like I said, what's interesting is he taught his household the word of the Almighty. He taught him the command. So I think they probably would have been like, oh, you know, we don't need anything. We got everything we need. We got the Almighty on our side. <laughs> what you gonna give me? You know, he's the one that owns all the silver, all the gold, all the trees to make the money. You know, what do you, can you give me? You know, so yeah, that's that's kind of like how I see uh, Abram. Like I don't want any of it. You can't say no man can say, I made Abram rich. He's not trusting in no man. I find that interesting. So why tithe? Go to the next one. Huh? Why tithe? And why tithe to a complete stranger that we first see the first time, all of a sudden he just shows up after war and he gives him a tenth. Why a tenth? Was that 30%? <laughs> 30% is that what they got? You know, the <laughs> And the word the word tithe there is actually in, in the Hebrew is, is that maaser, uh, uh, which is a tenth. So it's literally a tenth part of everything that he had. Uh, and it was a tenth of this, a tenth of this, a tenth of this, a tenth of this. So it was like a tenth of everything what he gave this man. So you're talking about a big tithing. He gave him a tithing, and he wasn't just a, a little thing. But it's interesting. Where did he get this concept of? Giving him a tenth. Doesn't say. So they went and started church, right? <laughs> this is your, this is your, your, your first uh, Saturday church. Because <laughs> you know it wasn't a Sunday church. <laughs> but, uh, oh goodness gracious. Anyways. <clears throat> Go to the next one, this one. So the first mention of tithe is associated with the distribution of goods. And possibly people. Was was this the first time Abraham tithed? And where did he learn about the tithes? Questions that can't be answered. Well, one can probably answer because we know he was around with Shem and, and Noah. So obviously, you know, Noah knew clean and unclean. 
uh, Adam, 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 uh, Adam walked and talked with the Almighty in the garden. So this is, to me, this is one of those really, yeah, so you have all this, it's, you know, you, you have the, the, uh, the rabbis who, who say that there was, you know, from Moses, there was another law that was given, that's the oral tradition, and it was passed down orally and orally and orally until, uh, until it was written down in like, uh, I believe about two or three hundred BC or uh, AD. And, uh, you know, but really, this was the very first, the, the law of the Almighty was the, 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 you could say was the oral, oral law. Because you had Jehovah talking directly to, to Adam. You had him talking directly, even to Cain, who had sin that was building up in his life, get ready to murder, get talking to Cain, and knowing what was righteous and what was un, what was acceptable, what was not acceptable. Talking to Noah was was speaking directly to him, speaking directly to Abraham, calling him out from the, from Ur of Chaldea. Speaking with with even speaking with Noah, I mean with uh, with Moses, excuse me. Speaking him to directly that this was the, the oral law. Would you if you wanted to take it that sense? This would have it was the original oral law, and then and then he even goes farther to to want to talk to the rest of the people, but they decide I don't want to hear you, you know. Which is it's okay, fine, it's good because uh, it's better that that. Uh, because I know what you people are going to do. <laughs> it was not Sunday churches. <laughs> you're going you're to do all kinds of nonsense. So we need to write this down. But um, he, he, it was always, it was, it was like an oral law. It was him speaking directly to the people, telling them, teaching them, showing them. And we see a lot of this stuff because, I mean, it's obvious that that uh, that's the only way most of these, if not. All of the every single person that we see in the scriptures, um, even Jacob, who was later called Israel, was being taught directly from the Almighty. Uh, and I believe today is that's what Father still wants. He's given us His Word, which I cherish so greatly because, to me, when we read the scripture, when I read the scripture, it's like having a conversation with the Almighty. It's like Him speaking directly to me, and that's what it really is. And uh, You know, Abraham had something about, about the book tithing, hospitality. He loved to <laughs> bring people in and feed them, you know. That's what he did. He waited for people yeah. to come by, so he'd bring them in his house and feed them, you know. What was that? <laughs> yeah, so you see him. And and seeing this, what I, I love about this is because there's, there's all these things in Genesis, and, and, and for some reason people put away the law like it starts in Exodus, yet the law has a whole lot to do with. with you know, hospitality and loving and and being gracious and and you know we talked about this you know a few weeks back so with loving your brother and you know all that kind of stuff. It has to do with just generosity and and then oh, there's sure. more. You need to learn how to share. Remember when we were little kids? We were supposed to learn how to share. Okay. Yeah, you got a chair. <laughs> but, um, you learn that? <laughs> Not everybody caught on. You know, so that's that's why when the scripture says that even right. even when the the nations when the heathen has and they start doing the law when they do it just out of nature it shows how how perfect the law is because even even the the one who says I don't want nothing to do with, with the Almighty with Yovah nothing to do with his commands they still do all I find that awesome um, so I want to end next one now. the next two slides here I don't want to overpower you guys. Uh, the argument. Go, homework. Go back, Neil. <laughs> go back. Also, I work homework or <laughs> the argument that we can't pay tithes or give offering because there was no temple or there's no Levites obviously is not valid because the first time we see tithing being implemented, there is no temple, there's no tabernacle, there's no Levites, there's no there's no Aaronic priesthood, there's no Levi, period. There's no Jacob. There's no Israel. There's the Hebrew. So uh, that argument is obviously it's not valid. 
Also, the statement that tithes are only flocks, herds, or produce is false. Okay, I've got a, I've got a situation for you. There's no temple, you know, other stuff. I want your tithe. <laughs> I want We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. Trust me. Like I said, there's so much in this that I, I, I was, I was thinking for some reason. I was thinking when I first started, and, and Father really started to put this in, in me, that uh, we would be able to, I'd be able to get maybe, you know, and at the very most three weeks, very, very most. I mean, that's if, if, uh, you know, we sang for like an hour and then. And then started the teaching, had like a 20 minute teaching or something. That I, I figured that was all that you know I was going to need. And now I'm looking at it now, and I think we may be on this for a little bit. And I, I hope, I hope, and I, I pray that you want to uh, to dive in the scripture with with this stuff. <laughs> but um, I if, want to know how we can collect that time. <laughs> <laughs> See, there you go. So next one, Neil. Here's. Here's one. <laughs> so here's here's some homework for you because this has to do with and we're gonna we're gonna go into this is the book of Hebrews, um, but I don't want to dive into that right away. I still have. Oh my goodness, please. probably about another fifteen slides. Okay, maybe a lot more. Anyways. <laughs> I still had a whole lot more. I was, like I said, I was thinking maybe I would get through all this stuff, but no. Uh, but here's some homework for you because we will be getting into this. And Hebrews, uh, for me, this is, you know, personally for me, when I was in the Christian church, it made no sense. Because I didn't understand the Levitical, I didn't understand the priesthood, I didn't understand uh, that we had to keep the commands. I didn't, I had no idea that that Jesus was even Jewish. I mean, so, I mean, that tells you something there, you know. So, I mean, the book of Hebrews to me was very, very confusing. And, uh, but now I read it and I love it. But, um, there's some homework. Check out, you can read the entire book of Hebrews, but I, I, but focus on chapter seven. Yeah. Focus on chapter seven, chapter seven to about chapter nine is, uh, deals a lot more with uh, Melchizedek and, and Yeshua being from that priesthood. <clears throat> and uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll actually, I'll, I can show you through the scripture who we should be tithing to today. Uh, but, like I said, before we get to that, I want to I wanna talk about Isaac. I want to, we're going to stop there, maybe go to the very, very, very end. Uh, uh, like, <laughs> it was but um, I want to talk about Isaac. I want to get to the Levites. I want to get to get into where we see tithes being a, a part of the law. I want to, you know, to go through there. And, yeah. I told you I said quite a few. <laughs> but um, I want because this is what I want to do. I want to literally separate the fact and the fiction. You know, I want to separate the the nonsense that people preach saying yes you gotta give us our tithes you gotta give us your tithe and you gotta you gotta follow the rules of this church and yet we don't believe in that old testament law because that's been nailed to the cross and then i want to i want to also take away the lies saying look you know we don't like this sunday you know we came out of this sunday church we came out of this sun worship and so now we don't have to pay tithes we don't have to give offerings because that's all been done away with and I find that interesting how there's messianics, there are messianic teachers, there are messianic uh, uh, I've read blogs and things that actually. What about that six figure salary I've been guaranteed? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, they, they too themselves have taken away from the law. They've taken tithing and offering away from the law. Uh, just like, you know, the. Just, just like the Pharisees, just like the Christian church is doing, except the Christian church is getting more of it and like just going, and they're like, oh, this one has tithe in it. Let's glue that back on them, uh, you know. But I mean, that's what they do. The the, the messianics just kind of do this little, you know, tearing a, a strip up. That's what I've seen. Um, 
and I don't want us to fall into that. And I, like I said, I believe in ties. I believed in ties prior to, to doing this, and then uh, listening to a few teachers, reading a few uh, from people that I that I follow that have brought me to this to what I am now. Uh, reading some of their, their material, listening to some of their material, and questioning, you know, why am I typing? What is this for? And is it for today? Should we be doing it? Should we not be doing it because there's no Levites and, and no temple? You know, am I am I wrong because I, I want to tithe? I want to give my tithe. And, um, you know, now looking through all the scripture and looking, knowing what I know now, after studying, after after finding out, for myself, and uh, I can say that this is what I believe, and this is why I'm going to teach it. But I want to show you how I came to it. I don't want to just say, "Look, this I believe it. We need to do it." And that, that's a couple. I'm the pastor. You need to listen to me. No, <laughs> no, I, that's that's not me. I'm I'm here for, as a, as a guide. I'm not nowhere nowhere in scripture. I don't care who you. Manipulate in the scriptures. Nowhere does it say that a pastor, an evangelist, a prophet, an apostle, a teacher, a a. Uh, fivefold. Yeah, you have the, the old, what the church calls the fivefold ministry. None of them are supposed to take control over people. They're not supposed to rule over the people. They are supposed to, according to Ephesians, they are supposed to equip, equip the people. Not not to rule over them. You know, I'm not here to know everything. You're not here to know everything. You're supposed to bless me. That's why that's why Paul says, you know, we should all come with with a, a song, with a hymn, with a, a spiritual song, with a prophecy, you know, with a word. I'm bringing a word. Now, you are supposed to bring a prophecy, you know, a, a, a healing, a, a something. We're supposed to reciprocate all the time. And that's why I love the fellowship. I love our fellowship because we get to do that. You know, you guys bless me, and I, I love the fellowship that we have. Um, but um, so as we end this as the tithe, part two, next week we'll have part three. <laughs> Again, like I said, I didn't want this to be a a marathon. I was, I was not expecting that at all. <laughs> But um, let's pray, and at the same time, I want to um, proclaim the blessing of it for every single one of you. So, Father, we come before your presence. We thank you one more time for this word. And I, I just thank you, Father, for your your revelation, for your your insight that you have opened our eyes, Father, to the the beautiful and hidden, wonderful things of your of your Torah, Father. I thank you that you have. You, 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 you've just uncovered things, and, and you've taken taken things out of uh, of just tradition, Father. That we see your word for what it is, Father. I ask that you bless each and every one of us here today, Father. That you just let your word saturate within us, that it grows, it brings forth fruit, it, it gives us a desire, a, a a love, and that a a a want to do your word, Father. I, I provoke. Each and every person, Father, to for for you, so that they can do good works, so they can do your will, that they can do your word, they can do your commands, Father. I I thank you for all your blessings. I thank you for the this Shabbat that you have blessed us with. I thank you for the meal that we're about to partake in. I ask that you just bless it, that you just bless our fellowship, that you you bless our our time together, Father. Anoint our lips that we speak your word, only your word that we that we have a good time, that we, we minister, that we bless one another, Father, in everything we do. We thank you and ask that you, you bring healing, that you bring, you bring peace, that you bring joy, that you, you bring your complete, your complete deliverance from anything and everything that may be wanting to come against your people today, Father. I thank you. In Yeshua's name. Shalom. Jehovah bless you and keep you. 
Jehovah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Jehovah lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> Bye, Jalon. Bye, Jalon. Bye, Jalon.